The Senate Commission overseeing the impeachment of Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff continues its deliberations. Plus, new shocking footages, footage from a drone in Ecuador shows the devastation after the, uh, the uh, last month's earthquake. Thanks so much for joining us for Tell Us Our English. I'm Cody Weddle and this is From the South. The Senate Commission, which will oversee the impeachment process against President Dilma Rousseff, continues meeting. Now, the 21-member commission has begun sessioning. Analysts believe that the opposition right-wing PMDB party is trying to speed up that process. Vice President Michelle Temer released a set of names he would designate as part of his cabinet. The Senate has until May 11th to vote on whether or not to continue the impeachment against President Rousseff. Meanwhile, former uh, president, Brazilian President Lula da Silva met with the head of the Senate, Renan Calheiros, and social movements representatives to discuss the ongoing impeachment process and to appeal to the legality of the process. Former President Lula, now head of the cabinet, has vowed to continue fighting against the impeachment process, which he believes is an attempt to politically bury the Workers' Party. Meanwhile, President Dilma Rousseff called out Eduardo Cunha, pointing out his offshore bank accounts. That person, Eduardo Cunha, who is the president of the lower chamber, everyone in Brazil knows he has accounts abroad, and he has been accused by the prosecutor general. New drone footage shows the impact of that 7.8 magnitude earthquake in the Ecuadorian coastal city of Perdanales. Now, the footage shot by an international news agency shows the amount of destruction left by the quake. The government there has now begun to reactivate their services as the coastal areas try to return to normal. 655 people are known to have died so far after that earthquake. Former Guatemalan President Otto Perez Molina and his former Vice President Roxana Valletti currently in jail for allegedly leading a bribery network to assign contracts are now involved in a new corruption scandal. Now, according to investigations, they participated in the irregular concession to build a port terminal awarded to the Spanish company TCQ Group. Havana's Cardinal Jaime Ortega has resigned from his post after being authorized by Pope Francis. Now, the Cardinal, who will soon turn 80 years old, had presented his resignation over four years ago. Over four years ago, as the Code of Canon Law indicates, has his term limit. Now, Ortega has been a key player in bringing the United States and the Cuban governments together after decades of hostility. Chilean Nobel laureate Pablo Neruda has been reburied at his coastal home in Isla Negra. He was exhumed three years ago to investigate his possible assassination. However, the results there were inconclusive, with some experts pointing at signs of cancerous elements in his body and others arguing these elements could also be a sign of poisoning. The Venezuelan opposition is moving forward with a recall referendum to oust President Nicolas Maduro. Now, the, the National Electoral Council has confirmed their request, and they have now they now have to gather signatures from one percent of registered voters. With more now, we turn to our correspondent here in uh, Caracas, Ian Bruce. So, Ian, now that we know the opposition has to gather thirty has thirty days to gather these signatures. The question here, is that a big task for them? Do they have the capacity uh, to, to achieve that? Well, I think so, Cody, yes. I mean, the opposition now has the forms that it needed in their hands. A group of opposition leaders went to the National Electoral Authority's offices this afternoon. They were handed the forms. And they had been calling for demonstrations across the country for tomorrow, Wednesday, in order to demand those forms. Now they've just announced that those demonstrations will not be held. Instead, they will begin the process of collecting the signatures tomorrow. And in fact, uh, Enrique Capriles, one of the opposition leaders, just gave a, a, a Twitter Periscope press conference and said that he expects them to collect those signatures not within 30 days, but within hours. Uh, so yeah, that really should be a problem. It's a very small number. There is one small uh, 
hiccup, if you like, on the way. It's not 1% of the electoral register as such that they have to collect in signatures. It's 1% in each of the 24 Venezuelan states. So that's a little bit more difficult. Some of the states have less support, but really it's a small number. It shouldn't be a problem for them. And explain a little bit this process, Ian. Now, this was 1%, as you were saying, and then there will be an, another process if they achieve that where they would have to collect even more signatures. I understand even 20%, is that right? right. The, 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 this triggers, if you like, the, 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 the next stage, um, which where they have to collect 4 million signatures. Obviously, that's a bigger task. But even so, you know, they won seven, more than 7 million votes in the parliamentary elections in December, so you'd think that wouldn't be a big problem. It doesn't necessarily translate over because there are lots of reasons why that got that vote, not necessarily absolute support for the opposition. But I, I don't think the real issue for the opposition is the number of signatures. That should, uh, you would imagine that that, that, was, that would be within their grasp. I think there are two other issues that may be more worrying for them. Well, three, in fact. Obviously, the, if once they actually get the four million signatures, they would then have to win a recall referendum. That's a much, much bigger task and much more uncertain, the outcome. Uh, secondly, there's a question of time. Uh, because if this process drags on, and it could drag on for some time, if it, if it goes beyond the 10th of January next year, 2017, then it's no longer a newly elected president who would take over from President Maduro if he were to be recalled, but it would be the vice president. And that obviously wouldn't be uh, what the opposition are looking for. Uh, and there's another issue which they're not talking about and they're avoiding, um, but it's an interesting one, which is the opposition itself has been very divided about what road to follow in this process of trying to bring down the current Bolivarian government. Uh, last night, uh, the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional one of the other paths they were following, which is, was the idea of a, of a constitutional amendment to cut short President Nicolas Maduro's mandate to four years. That was being pushed very hard by the party which currently leads the opposition in the National Assembly, Acción Democrática, Democratic Action. So they've taken a bit of a blow from that. It's Primero Justicia, the other main opposition group in the National Assembly, actually the one that has the largest numbers in, it, in itself, uh, who have been pushing mainly for the recall re referendum. So we're going to have to see how those differences between within the opposition play out as well and, and to what extent they're able to keep everybody on board. Decision by the Supreme Court uh, on the front pages, uh, front page of various uh, newspapers here in Caracas today. Ian, thanks so much. We go to Bolivia now. Bolivian President Evo Morales has announced a new raise to the minimum wage after meeting with the country's main workers' federation. Um, the, despite following, falling gas prices, Bolivia's main income, uh, the president agreed to raise the minimum wage 9%, while wages in general will be raised 6%. The government also held meetings with disabled activists who are demanding more benefits from the government. The Mercosur Bloc of Nations celebrated its 25th anniversary in its headquarters in Uruguay. The foreign ministers and deputy ministers of the five-nation body, uh, together with lawmakers from the region, praised the advance in regional integration achieved by the bloc throughout these years. The multidisciplinary team of independent experts tasked to investigate the case of the 43 disappeared Ayotzinapa students in Mexico presented their second and final report on the case. Now, although the team's work was cut short and has been left unfinished, the second report underscores the multiple deficiencies and problems that plague the government's case. Our correspondent Clayton Khan now explains. For the group of independent experts, the coordinated and violent attack committed by the authorities against the five buses commandeered by Ayotzinapa students in Guerrero was much more extensive than previously determined. The admission by the authorities to investigate evidence of a pattern of hidden drug shipments in bus services as part of the motive behind the attack has left the experts troubled. We're talking about the possibility of a fifth bus. The state of Guerrero is the first in heroin production in this country, and Cocula countryside is full of puppy crops. It is strange that there is no analysis made by narcotics. In the second and final report on the independent group's investigation of the Ayotzinapa case, contradictions, methodology issues, and possible fabrication of evidence was underscored as plaguing the government's case. The experts reiterated the lack of scientific basis in the official file and questioned the veracity of presumed key confessions. 
He, who presumably is El Gil, has been tortured and has the eardrum ruptured. The method of torture known as the telephone is considered to be the oldest method, at least in Latin America. The experts also found sufficient evidence that federal authorities, including the military, were aware in real time of the attacks on the Ayutzinapa students on the night of September 26, 2014. Upon repeatedly requesting to interview military and federal police personnel, the multidisciplinary team found a dramatic drop in cooperation from the authorities. And the investigation procedures were unnecessarily delayed or were directly rejected. On March 15, 50% of our requests had yet to be made. However, in response to the second report, Mexico's Attorney General's office expressed its commitment in bringing complete justice in the Ayotzinapa case and denies that it has hindered the work of the independent experts. The Mexican government has provided the team of experts at all times with everything they have required for their work. Yet for the families of the victims, for 19 months since the students were disappeared by police, the authorities have expressed a double discourse of the role of the experts, publicly applauding their participation, but privately seeking to minimize their presence in the investigation. The government simply has fear. It has fear because it leaves are ruffled. In one way or another, they have tried to remove the experts because the experts continue to dig. Although the second mandate of the group of experts terminates on April 30th, with no renewal, the team, along with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, have expressed their commitment to pressure the Mexican authorities in continuing the investigation until truth and justice is delivered. Clayton Khan del Sur, Mexico City. The World Health Organization announced good news for Latin America. The health body issued a report confirming that the Zika virus is being controlled by the region's authorities and its spread has dramatically declined. However, the report also warned that the virus could surface in other regions of the world. At least 35 people, including eight children and five rescue workers, have been killed in the Syrian city of Aleppo and its outskirts. They were killed in attacks carried out by the government forces and the rebels, according to a monitoring group. The rescue workers were killed when their headquarters in the town of al Atarib was hit by an airstrike. Meanwhile, in Geneva, a Syrian opposition group tolerated by President Bashir al-Assad's regime said it had asked the UN to merge all opposition factions into one delegation at, delegation at the next round of peace talks. While the head of Syria's government delegation uh, confirms it is leaving Geneva tomorrow after, quote, useful and constructive talks. Several international delegations are visiting Syria this week. For more on that story, we turn to our correspondent Hazem, du Hazem Abdullah. He's in Damascus. For the first time uh, since the start of the Syrian crisis, a U.S. senator arrived today to Damascus uh, in a visit for three days, uh, where he is expected to meet with the head of the Syrian parliament and the Grand Mufti of the Syrian Arabic Republic uh, after visiting the ancient city of Palmyra. The U.S. Uh, senator Richard Blake assured during a statement to the Syrian news agency SANA that what is happening in Syria uh, is terrorism. And the subject is simply that the terrorists are fighting the Syrian people and its uh, legitimate government. And that there are no moderate fighter uh, in Syria. He added also that he hopes uh, he would be able to let the people in the U.S. Uh, to know the reality about Syria. Uh, the importance of this visit it's, uh, in its timing since its uh, coincidence with the arrival of several international and Arab delegation to Syria yesterday uh, and today including the delegation uh, from France, uh, Europe Parliament and the Greece uh, or the visit uh, of the Algerian Minister of Maghreb and African Union, Abdul Qadir al-Mishal, uh, all of these in a movement to break the, the political siege imposed in Syria by the uh, Western Boers uh, and in an effort to move the will of the political dialogue. For Tilisur, from Damascus, Hazma. Voters in five northeastern U.S. states are casting their ballots in a series of primaries that could cement the leads of presidential frontrunners Hillary Clinton and also Donald Trump on the Republican side. Now, according to recent polling, Clinton and Trump hold sizable leads in all five contests. Trump's Republican rivals Ted Cruz and John Kasich uh, supposedly teamed up to help each other in, in the Indiana, Oregon and New Mexico primaries. After two years of hearings into Britain's worst sporting disaster, the 1989 Hillsborough Stadium crash, 
A jury concluded, uh, a jury concluded police failures were to blame for the deaths of 96 Liverpool soccer fans. The verdicts of unlawful killing could pave the way for which, uh, for prosecutors, family, family members of the victims campaigned for almost 30 years to get justice for their relatives. They refused to accept the deaths were accidental and accused police of covering up exactly what happened. Notwithstanding the difficulties along the way, the conclusion of the renewed inquest does bring both significant progress on the journey to expose the truth and we hope some degree of comfort and sense of closure to the bereaved. British junior doctors went on their first ever all out strike in a bitter deadlocked row with Prime Minister David Cameron's government over pay and conditions. While there have been several recent stoppages, this strike affected hospital emergency care units such as accident, emergency and maternity units for the very first time. Papua New Guinea's Supreme Court has ruled that the detention of asylum seekers and refugees on Manus Island is unconstitutional and must stop. Now, under Australia's controversial immigration laws, anyone intercepted while trying to reach the country by boat is sent for processing at camps to camps in Nauru and Manus Islands. The Australian Greens welcome the announcement by the Supreme Court of PNG uh, that states very clearly that the detention of Innocent people seeking asylum uh, on Manus Island is illegal. We now know once and for all that it's not the actions of those innocent asylum seekers who are coming to us seeking their protection that's illegal. It is in fact the actions of the Australian government. The leader of Spain's Socialist Party, Pedro Sanchez, says a new general election in Spain is unavoidable as he lacks the support to seek a new confidence vote in Parliament to become Prime Minister. Sanchez said he had been willing to discuss a potential left-wing coalition, but conditions set by the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party earlier in the day had made that impossible. Thousands of followers of Shia cleric Muqtwa al-Sarar held a mass protest in front of the Green Zone where Iraqi parliament, government offices and many foreign embassies are located. Now the demonstrators back a planned reshuffle which would hand key portfolios to independent technocrats in a bid to root out corruption that has hindered the provision of public services since the 2003 U.S.-led invasion. The youngest prisoner in the world has been released from an Israeli jail. With more now and an explanation, here's Noor Harazin. The 12-year-old Palestinian young girl, Dima Lwawi, believed to be the youngest prisoner in the world, has been released from prison. Dima is now at home with her family in the West Bank after some 75 days in an Israeli jail. Her parents has appealed for her early release two weeks ago. Israeli authorities ceded in exchange of a $2,100 fine. On February 9, Dima was arrested at the entrance of Karm Tazar, an illegal Israeli settlement near Hebron. Israeli authorities accused her of allegedly trying to stab a Jewish soldier with a knife. The young girl was sustained to four months and a half for attempted voluntary manslaughter. Detaining Palestinian children is an Israeli systematic policy which aims to break the will and the spirits of Palestinian children. It is a crime against humanity and a clear violation of all the international law. Israel is turning its back to all the international agreements which prohibit the arrest of its children. Her arrest caused worldwide outrage and expressed support to her. Israeli law does not allow prison assistance to children under the age of 14. Israeli military law, however, does allow for Palestinian children living under Israeli occupation in the West Bank to be charged with nationalistic motivated offenses. Dima's lawyer, Abir Bakr, said her client was arrested along with Palestinian adults. She was denied frequent family visits in violation of international children's law. In spite of this, the NGO Defense of Children International Palestine said that up to February of this year, 
416s, including 108 under 16, have been held in Israeli jails. No Harris Interesu TV, Palestine. South Africa has gifted a six-foot statue of late anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela to Palestine. The statue has been placed in West Bank's de facto capital. Uh, the statue is a symbol of friendship and demonstrates South Africa's solidarity with the people of Palestine. South Sudan's rebel leader Riek Machar has been sworn in as vice president in a boost for a peace deal aimed at ending more than two years of conflict. Now He returned earlier to the capital Juba to take the post in a new unity government led by President Salva Kiir. Tens of thousands have been killed and about two million people left homeless in the conflict. Soccer team Atletico Madrid are, are at the crucial part of the season. They could win two trophies, including the Champions League. Now, in the Champions League, Atletico Madrid is up against the best teams in Europe. On Wednesday, they face German giants Bayern Munich in the first leg of the Champions League semifinal in Madrid. Then there is the battle to win the Liga title against their arch rivals, Real Madrid and Barcelona, with three games left in the Spanish League. They rank second, but are joint top with Barcelona. Paraguay has been added to the list of countries jointly hosting the 2017 edition of the Dakar Rally. It will be the ninth time the marathon car, motorbike, motorbike and lorry race has been held in South America after switching from Western Africa. And that's what we're covering on this Tuesday. Thanks so much for joining us. Plenty more on all of those stories and plenty others at our website, telesertv.net slash English. We'll see you back here tomorrow.